Well, welcome to the Backroads Bill podcast. I'm Ben, and as always, pleased to be joined by Backroads Bill. Bill, how are you doing this week? I'm good enough, and you know, I'm really looking forward to talking about this story. Well, it's almost hockey season, and in today's episode, we're going to be diving into one of hockey's greatest stories that was already well-known, but then got really catapulted into pop culture history by the Tragically Hip with their song, 50 Mission Cap. Uh, This is the story of Bill Barilko and the trek Backroads Bill took to find the legendary crash set. So Bill Barilko is really a famous uh, Toronto Maple Leaf. Uh, What can you tell us about him and his time with the Leafs? There's only two Maple Leaf numbers retired, Ace Bailey and Bill Barilko, who we're going to talk about. And, and, you know, he was a poor skater. I mean, he was a boy from Timmins. And again, his brother was a better hockey player than he. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came up through the ranks and he he was uh, relegated to Hollywood, California, he was called Hollywood Bill, and he uh, then he was brought up through the minors um, in the American Hockey League because the Toronto Maple Leafs at the time uh, he played, you know, he was uh, four Stanley Cups in five years, and he was brought up to uh, and he was known as bashing Bill Barocco because he was the ultimate body checker, and uh, so. Uh, when you think about it, and it, it, the goal he scored in April 21st of 1951 has, uh, in some circles, has been identified as one of the most important sporting highlights. Uh, the Toronto Star actually reported that. And anyway, it was a monumental moment. There's a epic photo of him flying through the air, kind of like that Bob Yor moment mm-hmm. where he actually did a backhand in the net. Uh, and uh, so, again... He lives on, but it was after that that he really became uh, more well-known. Well, he definitely had his moments in the spotlight, but for his legacy is more about really what happened to him, you know, after that Stanley Cup win. Yeah, it was four months later after that Stanley Cup game-winning goal that um, he departed on a fishing trip with Dr. Henry Hudson, a a dentist from Timmins, a, a friend, and um, they set off to uh, head to the Seal River um, in a small, small float plane, a Fairchild 24. And um, he, on August 26, he never returned. It was supposed to be uh, the last gassing up was at Rupert's house. And um, they never came back. And then, of course, he, the, the greatest aerial plane search in Canadian history started to occur. You know, and then, of course, he, he wasn't found uh, until many, many years later. Yeah, and, and of course, the, the, there was all kinds of rumors uh, that occurred. And it's part of the legend where, of course, he was not, they were not found. And, and the Toronto Maple Leafs didn't w- win another Stanley Cup until 1962. And there was a myth involved in that. And, uh, and even beyond that, because the Leafs have not won a Stanley Cup, uh, I guess, after 1967. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's still, the drought is on. But th- there was... Rumors that he had defected to Russia and that he had, you know, smuggling gold out of northern Ontario because uh, Timmins is known as the city with the heart of gold mm-hmm. and, and uh, that, and of course, he defected to Russia and so on and so forth. And uh, it, was a, it was a time, and so years went by. They obviously turned the, the, the search off and he, he, they were not found until uh, June 7 of 1962 when a helicopter pilot saw a uh, almost like a raven seeing a glint of some shiny material on the ground. They had to actually circle around it and they actually went back and had to come back and it was difficult to find the second time because it wasn't the time of GPS. And so uh, that they found them and uh, eventually they, they came back with a party, um, landed about uh, a mile away and uh, trudged through there. And I'll talk about how I've been in that that terrain. Mm-hmm. And uh, they found them strapped into their carpet, cockpit seats, uh, skeletons and fish skeletons in the pontoons because that's how they tra- transported the, the fish. It was, uh, it was thought that um, the plane may have been overloaded. They were uh, set to go with three people, but it was too much weight, small plane, and they probably had a ton of fish. And I know uh, from records that coming back from Rupert South, there was an extremely um, heavy uh, headwind and so basically ran out of gas. And and Dr. Hudson was known as a a pilot who took chances. So nonetheless, Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of variables there and and, and they crashed. And the the location is about 100 kilometers north of Cochrane. 
and um, in in dense black spruce uh, environment, and we can talk about it a little later. But that's uh, that's a fast forward of how he was found, and yeah. then and then it was years later in 2007, 16, 17, the community under Kevin Vincent, they were they had convinced that they should go in and get parts of the wreckage, uh, and so. Uh, they even had a difficult finding finding the crash site again because there was no GPS and there were hand drawn maps or topo maps where someone probably put a dot on the map, and so eventually they found the spot. They flew in, and again it was a, a fair distance away. Uh, there's no you know no landing strips, <laughs> no cleared areas, and they took a lot of the wreckage out, uh, which is still in Timmins, and I can talk a bit about that. But and and there's been you know attempts to make dis- displays, and and so Kevin Vincent was instrumental. At the same time, Kevin Shea, who worked for the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, uh, wrote the wrote a book about all of this, and then TSN had a, a yep. video, and and so this whole legend. Uh, kept going from from the moment he disappeared until uh, the tragically hip and the TSN video, and again became yep. ingrained in our northern Ontario culture and Canadian culture as well, because it was one of those things that he it was a real mystery, so yep. to speak. You know, and, and what does the team do during this time of uncertainty? Yeah, I think the best way to put it is that his jersey hung up in the Toronto Maple Leaf dressing room for an entire year before they yeah. actually removed it. Everyone, like all these instances, they never, no one gives up hope. Yep. Uh, and uh, and again, the air search carried on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and uh, people did not give up uh, because mm. people do uh, crash, but they often are uh, survivors. Yep. So that went on for a good length of time. But but after about a year, I I, I think people then came to the realization that Bashan Bill Barocco was not going to return to that Toronto Maple Leaf uh, lineup. And uh, although they kept looking, uh, it was that good long length of time until 1962 that uh, they they actually uh, found the crash site, as we were talking about earlier. And then when they finally found his crash site, it was actually a mistake. They were way off course. And again, it could have been, it could have been that... Um, headwind, but they were way off course from where they were, they were, were supposed to be traveling. And so um, that whole closure aspect, uh, it was headlines again, never mind the headlines of the day in 1951, summer of 1951, but in 62, uh, the, you know, finally there was closure about what happened to Bill Barocco. He was actually buried uh, in, in Timmins uh, and there were no bones, uh, the, the huge headstone. In fact, as we know, the second most asked question uh, where did Shania Twain uh, grow up? Where is Bill Barocco buried? And mm-hmm. when you go to that headstone in the cemetery, and I've been there, there's all kinds of commemorative Toronto Maple Belief uh, memorabilia there left behind the people who uh, want to just be part of that legend, be part of that story, and un- understand how important that was in, in Maple Leaf history at the time. So, Bill, you actually went to the crash site. Uh, so tell me, how did you get into this place that was really pretty much impossible to get to? I'm not a Toronto Maple Leaf hockey fan. I'm not even a hockey fan per se. Someone told me about Bill Barocco a while back, and then we we all know the tragically hip song. And mm-hmm. and um, someone said, "Well, you should try to go to the crash site." And uh, we met Kevin Vincent in Timmins, uh, and and uh, met him before that. And then the whole with a buddy Brian Emblem from Timmins, we had to like all of the treks, and recently just came back from the most northern point in Hudson Bay, and with the polar bears, every re- trek re- requires some some planning. And in this particular case, we're in a very remote location where the plane crash was. And again, mentioned it's 100 kilometers north of Timmins, but you just you just don't go there. There's no roads. So yeah. we had to determine what is the closest logging road. And then there are the rivers in between that run towards Judge um, James Bay. And I'll put it in perspective too. Adam Schultz, who is with the Royal Canadian Geographic Geographical Society, a fellow noted as one of the most um, important trekkers uh, to um, to to be noted as such. He, one of his first books, Alone Against the North, was set north of Detour Mine, north of Timmins, or and Cochrane, I should say, where he had to get to um, the river had never been traversed before. Uh, so that's the same country, that same stunted black spruce, uh, almost tundra-like environment. So in our planning, we had to figure which is the best way. And, and for us, it was 
uh, it was going to be uh, north of Smooth Arc Falls, north of the Abitibi Canyon Generating Station, uh, taking a snowmobile trail, the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs, uh, number A103, and we decided what's the best time of the year. So um, during the other three seasons, it's v it, it, the, we know the trail was kind of underwater, the snowmobile trail, that it's very, very, very spongy and, and water-like. So ATVs w w could have been a problem. We did... We did uh, go for, Brian actually went for a couple of reconnoiters, but then we decided it would be early winter. Mm. The ground's going to firm up. We would uh, have snowshoes. We had to traverse one creek. So we bought a yard sale uh, surfboard for $50 and we actually towed it in on that day. It was just before Christmas, a couple of weeks before Christmas, a couple of years back. And uh, we set off with four snow machines on that trail, which was not open at the time, there was so much windfall from the summer that that uh, was one of the challenges. We were towing the surfboard. When we got to the location that was approximately mm, just shy of seven kilometers from the crash site off the trail, that's when we tried to drive the snow machines in so far. And we, we knew that we had to get to the creek and we didn't know if the creek would be iced in or that we'd have to use the surfboard. And then we set off on snowshoes snow sho snow and um, it, it became problematic. I knew that very same day, having been on countless treks in the winter, that it was an early winter snow. We were going through it. There was no firmness and we almost made the creek, but we ended up being still, I think, 4.2 kilometers from the crash site, and we're thwarted. But the but the whole opportunity to try to get there and be part of this legend was just that. Because people mm. often ask me, why did you do that? And I, again, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm not a hockey fan. It was all about maybe paying respect to Bill Barocco or just getting there to, as a sense of a of accomplishment because no one has ever walked in. It, they always f go in by helicopter. Uh, was there any sort of like memorials or anything else to commemorate where the crash site was? The, the Timmins community, and I believe there was about 11 people that went in at the time, uh, they left memorabilia there and some signs, but nature is very forgiving. And since that time, I'm sure it's trees have blown down. Mm -hmm. uh, the snow covers everything up. Even Ronnie Shuker and the uh, the, the helicopter pilot, uh, they, they didn't really know if they were on the site. Uh, the same helicopter pilot took the Timmins people in, uh, and as took Ronnie in, but uh, again, it was, it was the same time this winter passed just before Christmas and they encountered the same trudging in from a short distance. So they thought they were on the site, but things were covered up. And again, the pontoons and the, the main part of the wreckage, it's pretty much all gone. I'm sure there's tidbits of things there, and, and the signs, again, could be there, but no official monument. Um, the thought was, I know, uh, with Brian and myself and the others who went in there, that we would leave something significant. And perhaps, I know at the time, before we were planning this, the mayor of Cochrane at the time said, oh, it would be great to have a trail in there. But we've discovered since then that would be a heck of a place um, to, to make a trail. It's kind of like when another backwards bill story, which we may talk about where the geographic center of Ontario is and mm -hmm. people can think about that and then went there and then uh, had to get, and then we decided we'll get to the center and then beyond that, the four extremes, surveyed extremes of Ontario. But what I'm really saying is that uh, there's no monument there at the center of Ontario and there's no monument there at the Bill Barocco site. And how long did it take for you to trek through and, and get really as close to that crash site as you could? Yeah, well, the planning took a long time. As I said, we had to figure that out and do some reconnaissance to know wh what the best straight line distance was because that's what you had to do initially. Again, there there was a snowmobile trail on, on one side and logging roads on the other and um, the... Um, Abitibi River in between, little Abitibi River. And so we had to do that. And then just getting ready for the trek, snowmobiles and, uh, the, you know, the things you, you make a list of safety, safety wise to try to, to make your assault like you would at the top of a mountain or a trek. And it's, a, it's the same, same story every time to try to do that. And, and in this case, um, I, I, in my mind, I didn't know. I met, we set off at, 
uh, I think it was five o'clock in the morning from Smooth Rock Falls because it's a hundred kilometers north of the Abitibi Canyon and then uh, set up. It had to get changed into snowmobile gear at the dam and then set off. And again, I explained how there were trees in the way. It, it's it's it all takes time to try to do that and and make the what it was about thirty kilometers or more down the trail. But again, we encountered slush. We encountered windfall and then set, and setting out. Uh, the machines could only go so far. Snowshoes. Again, we started to trudge, and that black, uh, that black spruce, that diminutive, dense black spruce forest, uh, got in our way. So it it, uh, it was okay that day. Um, when we set out, we we left Timmins, and of course, there's one sign of for for Bash and Bill Barocco with his fist up in the air. And it's a, a billboard. Took the community a long time. Kevin Vincent a long time to get it there, positioned on Highway 101, coming into Timmins from Highway 11. And so that and the headstone uh, are the two remaining things. And of course, they're trying to get a Bill Barocco exhibit together. Uh, there is Mr. Maple Leaf called Mark Farah. He um, he's a collector of all kinds of Maple Leaf me- uh, memorabilia, and he has many many things, including. Uh, which was thought that they didn't know where the that that overtime puck went to, but eventually they found it and it has been authenticated as the game game winning puck. But he has all kinds of things uh, that are related to Bill Barocco and 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 Bill's family, extended family has have uh, donated a lot of things. So again, in Timmins itself, there will probably be a shrine of sorts someday. At least there's the billboard for now. Well, thank you, Bill, for joining me. You can find more episodes of Backroads Bill on Wednesdays in audio form on all the popular podcast players, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. And if you want to watch the video version, you can go over to northbayecho.ca. And while you're there, you can also see all the other local North Bay podcasts that are both produced by Echo, uh, like To North Bay With Love, which is our flagship show, or other local creators like Small Town Times. And speaking of hockey and with the battalion and voodoo season just starting, uh, you can also check out uh, the front line as well. Bill, before we leave, any last nuggets of wisdom you want to leave us with? Thank you, Ben, and, and we'll look forward to another uh, another podcast of something interesting on the back roads. 